Welcome, fellow anglers, to the Working Class Fishing Podcast, a place for all anglers, amateur or expert, to share their stories and learn about fishing. Join your hosts, John and Brian, each episode as they debunk the perceived inaccessibility to fishing, break down the barriers of any and all angling methods, and hear stories from other anglers and their own journeys with fishing. Now, let's get this show started. Welcome back to another episode of the Working Class Fishing Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Brian, and here is the esteemed Mr. John Morris Esquire V, although not named, with our sponsors. Hey everybody, welcome back to Working Class Fishing. Uh, this episode is brought to you by Anadromous Fly Company, 317 Flies, Lid Rig, Anger Rooster Fly Company, CD Fishing USA, Go, oh, and uh, Mr. Shirker Naughty Tackle. Uh, go check them out. Uh, they've got a bunch of really awesome deals for all you people. Yeah, absolutely. Go check every one of them out. And as you know, here in the Pacific Northwest, uh, by the time you're hearing this, we are going to be getting in gear for Springer season, which brings our next guest up here. Our next guest has a company based here in Clackamas, Oregon, and he's been doing this for quite a while. He's got a lot of experience. He's going to fill us all in on it. Wanted to welcome Andrew Larson. Uh, he is the developer and owner of further north lures and he has a very some very unique products uh that he he has out there and not a lot of people know about andrew's lures but the one thing is is that these lures they have all the right stuff going for them and, and it they're proven and they work good so but i'm gonna let andrew talk about it but anyways andrew welcome to the show thank you for being here yeah thanks for having me on guys double brian's yeah <laughs> so um you know, the, the, the cool part is, is that, you know, we were talking before the show, we're talking about the innovation of, of your lures and stuff like that. Um, and, and you, you got this incredible product and people need to know about this because it works in multiple environments and multiple, uh, different types of things. Um, but yeah. before all that, uh, and everything else, what you were a guide. So you got some yeah. fishing stories. Yeah. What's, What's a fishing story that stands out in your mind? Oh, my second day as a captain uh, out of Homer, Alaska. And the previous day I was on a different boat. So I had to switch boats from Fox 4 to, uh, to Fox 6. And like I said, it's my second day. Um, the first day I did go out and get a lemon halibut. Um, but my second day i go out out of homer and three hours out we're talking um togishi point then basically where elizabeth is and then you head between elizabeth and pearl and you're like on the back of a pinnacle it's three hours out and i was tagging along with the guys on the other boats you know but that day i got like 173 and 160 and a bunch of like 80 pound um halibut and it it just seemed like the ocean was so bountiful and you know i had beginner's luck too so that day definitely um, sticks out for sure and then another day that was really stupid i tried to anchor up in like 500 feet of water with like 10 footers probably and uh <clears throat> that that was scary because i have a way too much line out and i was trying to just get a limit I'm I'm trying to fathom, and we've always heard the legends of the barn doors from Alaska. 160 yeah. and 180 pound halibut. I mean, that is uh, lengthwise. Just just for perspective, I mean, I I know uh, that's that's a big fish, yeah. but what what are you it, looking at lengthwise on on a fish like that? My uh, first day as a mate getting trained out there, um, we went way out to like somewhere in the Kennedy entrance. And we got a 313 pounder and uh, that fish was seven foot three. And in that um, old DVD video that I sent you that the big halibut was 232. And I remember it being six foot eight. That was the one you had to shoot twice, yeah. right? Yeah, it shot it twice. Yeah. And I had to throw the anchor for it because it was hanging out on the surface, like a, a sail kind of. And so that's why it came up and, you know, we were able to get it on the boat. And that, that was like my uh, fifth day or something. <laughs> Holy smokes. 
yeah you know people were telling me where to go you know they're looking out for the new guy and yeah. so i got i gotta break myself in all right still though, that's that, that's a fish of a lifetime <laughs> yeah you know nowadays it's kind of frowned upon to be uh to be catching those big cows and and i i don't think i would keep one now but you know it was 2002 and i was a trophy hunter back then i can't i can't deny it i think I, some, go ahead brian i think i think when we're young and we're ambitious there's there's yeah. a little bit of that that trophy hunting that goes on no matter what yeah i yep yep that led me to the Kenai where there was big Chinook and man, we messed that run up. But, um, we, we did a lot of back trolling of plugs and, and that, you know, salmon have always been my, uh, my muse, I guess you could say. Oregon, Alaska. Definitely. I mean, I, you know, I, I saw the fish that you were catching up there in the DVD there again. You know, and that guy, I, I don't know how big that one that, that was all red was, but that was, that was no joke, a massive king. Oh, yeah. Oh, the one we uh, netted and uh, on the video. Yeah. Yeah, that was a, that was a darker fish. Um, that one was 62 pounds. And that was my, that was my first year guiding on the Kenai. And uh, so, yeah, I was, I was happy with that fish you know at that just, time uh i mean i i get pumped for you know 18 to 20 pounds chinook you know every every fish on the kenai back in the day in my mind could have been a world record because like sometimes big fish fight like small fish and vice versa and the water is like you know real silty and yeah that's definitely where i got my my egg fishing and my back trolling and passion for what turned into these lures definitely man i i just think about it and it's like you know i i know that you're passionate about like the june hogs also on the columbia and, yeah. and bringing that yeah. back too i i, I saw that yeah nice well yeah it, but you know i think there's a lot of us that want to see that the the big summer chinook again you know because right now our big fish in our area are fall chinook that's that's what we get for the big fish now yeah but, and and they don't get 30 pounders rarely anymore yeah you know uh, uh, there's been a lot of talk about like the sea lion predation on the early runs which is what supported the larger fish the larger fish came into the system earlier and so they had to be bigger to you know survive through the year and and do all that but the the predation of the sea lions on the early run before they run back out and shoot back down to the channel islands that's you know that that kind of decimated all of the 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 lower river stocks to the point to where yeah if we get some early fish and they're big they're they're there um but it's not the same as what it was you know uh 15 yeah. 20 well, years ago it's pretty amazing how we accidentally slash the guys down in south america there's like a bunch of different uh stories and i do have a link on my Columbia River Big Ten Coalition uh, Facebook group on all the backgrounds of all the plantings that have been done down there um, all the way back to like the 1800s and a lot of it was government records. Um, but I think we need to do a smolt capture down there and pay them per smolt and uh, have a terminal fishery of those big old 50, 70 pounders and because um, there are they're, they're Pacific Northwest fish from you know the Columbia, but also other places. And um, <clears throat> the, they laid we got real lucky that they did what they did because they've been spreading um, north and south, like you know, on a graph where it gets darker, and it was getting like darker north and south, they said 10 miles a year, and that was about like 2017 is when i read that wow yeah i haven't I, i'll have to definitely look at that uh, a little bit closer because i haven't you know we always talk about the june fishing in the columbia in july and it's really reverted to uh, a sockeye fishery you know uh in in that time frame but 
there's yeah. no reason not to have the the june hogs you know like we used to have it would be so cool and i i know that um like uh the cca they're they're trying to do a lot more but there's there's other things that work with that but you know it's it's going to be a difficult one to run yeah man what especially with the i don't know the way they they ran last summer's fishery with twenty thousand fish going over the dam a day you know the river closed and then the unfortunate part was you're like dang they did that like two and a half three years ago too you know mm -hmm. but uh you know that was that now is now yep let's Hopefully see we all learned yeah let's see what happens uh projections around here are looking good so you know that's that's the good thing uh run projections are looking real good it's going to be real stable and i think uh you know the sport fishing opportunity is going to start looking a lot better here um coming up but look sounds like uh washington is canceling gillnet uh gillnet permits uh on the washington side um that's what it's uh, i i've heard uh i haven't done a lot of research but that's been kind of the uh word through the grapevine uh so far in a few little news articles so um, if the lower Columbia, uh, gill net commercial gill netting is shut down, you know, obviously the tribal treaty rights are going to be there, but that's going to take a lot of pressure out of that system. That's what I was literally just about to ask that. I mean, you guys are, it's kind of foreign, but I'm, I'm, I listen to what a lot of you guys say and what Brian says pretty often. So the gill netting, I was pretty unaware of until, uh, you know, recently. Um, but I didn't know that people other than the confederated tribes could gill net there until also recently so if they took that out that would remove a lot of pressure yeah i will say this um i have commercial crabbed before and i know some you know commercial fishermen and uh, you know a lot of those guys they have pen raised salmon that we catch so it's like you know um there's a plus and minus there but to have gill nets in the river um you know when they when you can't put a hook and a worm on you know that's that's disgusting yeah i agree with that well uh i i also think back to um just a couple of the local grocery store ads where it said um columbia river steelhead and they had it shut down for steelhead and they were selling it 1799 a pound at uh fred meyer you know uh for, for yeah. everybody else in the united states that's kroger right uh wow. or, or fries or you know pick whatever but um here it's fred meyer and it, it said 1799 a pound and it was columbia river steelhead hyphen the whole nine yards and yeah and i'm i'm over here tearing my hair out trying to get the first winter steelhead of the year and i'm like why Main stem yeah. Columbia is shut down. These fish don't even have a chance to get to their, you know, the, back to the hatchery, you know, uh, the hatchery fish. That's all I want. I, I mean, it's fun to catch the wild, but I, I, I really just want the hatchery fish, but there's nets in their travel lanes all up and down the river. Yeah. It, that's kind of, you know, that's old technology. There's been, you know, thoughts of going back to fish wheels and fish traps from what I saw or I've seen a couple things on like Oregon Field Guide. But, um, you know, then they, then the con is like, you know, well, that fish got trapped four times and got separated. Um, I'm all up for any new bright ideas on on how to save, save and bring more fish in. Um, but I do think we should we should want i mean to have the chance to catch a 50 pounder it changes everything you get up earlier you know your hooks are going to be sharper it um you know 50 plus pounders the genetics we have originally been and you know they're down down there in chile and argentina mm -hmm. they just said they got a 105 pounder i don't know if you guys saw that floating yep. around it doesn't look like 105 pounder to me and that guy is pretty tall too but it looks like a really big fish and i've seen some uh like mid 80s that i know lost 20 pounds um out of argentina and that was really good to see a big fish like that come out of chile i haven't seen any 70s out of chile until then probably it's incredible and and, and they're pacific running fish at that point so that that's even yeah. better yeah they do 
they do have like a pretty pretty healthy anchovy shoals down there from a show i watched but i mean we've got really good bait out here it kind of you know every year one year is down but we have a lot of bait out there and i believe that the the fish that go into rivers inlet prove that we can support large chinook on the west in the northwest in my opinion absolutely because rivers inlet is like you know that's like the last oasis now yeah and, I, and they're doing it right they're 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 netting fish and doing like a broodstock program so mm -hmm. so that's good yeah <laughs> that, go ahead john no that's fine go ahead i kind of honestly i kind of forgot what i was going to say <laughs> <laughs> well well, well uh, the the broodstock thing you know uh we uh good friend of mine uh and i'm his client too logan ellis he's a guy down on the coast he participates in the broodstock program uh, for our listeners, you can go back and hear a little bit about the broodstock program from Logan directly, uh, because it, it is a vital program to restoring and um, keeping uh, genetics uh, pure uh, in, the, in the instance that we do have um, crossing of hatchery reared fish and wild fish. They're only one generation removed. Uh, that's, that's the big advantage, but we also get a bigger, meaner, nastier, aggressive fish out of the deal, too. That's the broodstock thing is awesome. I'm hoping that we start seeing more brood stocking of our of of Columbia River salmon over what we have now, and that goes for coho and chinook. I I really want to see a lot more effort put into that brood stocking program because the coho are getting more and more locked jaw, as you know. Um, the the more years we just keep recycling, and I understand that there's the 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 need uh, by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and NOAA and everybody else to to have fish stocks for killer whales to hunt and everything else i i understand that but we we should start really cleaning that up because not every uh river has good sorting facilities and we need to get those brood stocked salmon back as well in addition to the steelhead but it is an expensive program it does take a it takes a lot of manpower you know on the part of the hatchery technicians and and the biologists and everything else but if we want to preserve that wild stock we do need to have the hatchery brood stock in place uh not only for supplementation of commercial and recreational fishing but also to to help with that genetic gap yeah yeah no it's um i don't want to say it's exciting times because um because maybe it is maybe it isn't but yeah i hope i hope we can be happy with our fish and of course, you know, I've got the dream of you know, bringing big fish back, but regular hatcheries and, and the broodstock program are definitely, in my mind, um, not very necessary, if, you know, if they want to sell fishing licenses. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But, um, of course, you know, we did our job to get to where we're at. For sure. So. So, dude. Where, no. <laughs> how, how'd you get started in fishing, man? Good question. Uh, thanks for asking. Uh, you know, my dad was from Nebraska and he came out to Oregon in like the seventies and he caught a 60 pound lingcod on uh, the North jetty. And then he bought a little piece of property on a credit card. And so I got to grow up down there at the coast and, uh, it, you know, crossing the bar at five years old, crying kind of stuff, you know. But yeah, so that basically led me to wanting to be a fishing guide from the time I was like in seventh grade. Um, I just thought I could, you know, I always baited everybody's hooks. Uh, and I actually really did well and, and learned how to do better. And um with that, I worked at Fisherman's and then worked at a job up in Alaska at Trophy King Lodge. And after that, I got my captain's license and I was fish obsessed slash like love the cash, you know, side of the lifestyle and seasons like to fish in different places. It's brought me down to Key West. I was a mate on uh, two different charter boats down there and what, that was really was that? refreshing that it was like a real refreshing 
like course to take for as a fisherman from the northwest she's trying to make a herring spin like down there i'm trying to make a ballyhoo swim and not spin when it kind of wants to spin um yeah it was great there was lots of sun lots of people with the cruise ships coming in and key west lifestyle i was just recently single and um yeah i went down there and we caught like a decent amount of sailfish my captain and i we were pretty good at catching wahoo um and blackfin tuna so yeah fishing's been been in me for a while almost that's awesome really (laughs) so go ahead i was was just gonna say i mean it makes sense i mean but tell us about further north lures man like we we've got the background and i can see why 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 it exists because it's Mm -hmm. it's in your blood man it's it's what drives you like yeah it, it what does that for so many of us but for you man it's like it's there so yeah thanks that's a compliment i appreciate it <laughs> so yeah how did... so how it further north lures started as bada bing lures and uh i don't know i just like that term but i was driving on 205 just going from portland to vancouver and i'm like hey, i'm going a little further north you know and as an oregonian you know we didn't get pinks and chum like you guys do up in washington and you know as a guy who goes up to alaska or went up to alaska there's just like a draw to like oh if i go further north i'll probably catch more fish and so i grabbed that name further north lures but the first lure that um i designed was what really made further north lures you know something to put on a you know website on um and i came out with this lure right here it's called the twerk and it's it's a regular style um plug head that's off patent and i put a hole down the middle of it and had it come out at a a place that was chosen you know a lot of different places to to put it but it it ran with eggs and it did what I was trying to do, where it was like a counterbalance. I kind of thought it would do that, and then it did it. And um, and further north lures, that's how it started. Like 2020 in May, I went down to Clackamas and had a, a lure just painted a real ugly, like like these colors, like a <laughs> nightmare. But 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 man, it put a whole shrimp behind it. it it wiggled it and then I did smaller sizes with eggs and and I was happy. And uh yeah, and then I just started committing full time and I, I got into like designing these, you know, lures. If I can put a hole down the middle of a plug, you know, I can make something else. And so I made this uh what I call a buoyant blade. This lure right here is called the wacko. It has a scent stripe on the back side. So this so what is a scent side. stripe? Scent stripe is an indentation, like a track mark that is on the backside of the lure. So it's not directly head on the current. Okay. And it holds scents and gels about, you know, longer than it would be if there was nothing there, but it holds it for about okay. 20 minutes. I'd so say. that makes sense. That makes, okay. Yeah. I'm and, with you now. Uh, yeah. And so the, the twerk here, here's, you know, an old one, the new twerk has, uh, fast water um, placement hole and then uh, heavy load slash slower water regular water um, but going back to these uh, buoyant blades and the sense stripe um, this one right here pardon me this one right here without anything on the back is called the wacko this lure right here used to it's i'm calling it the villain now uh, i used to call it the felon <laughs> but um, but it, it too has a scent stripe and this one's caught fish and fished. Um, but you could see the notch and the hook goes right in the notch. And I made it so salmon eggs would spin. Like you could put salmon eggs on this, make sure you got a good uh, swivel. Um, 
but you can put salmon and eggs on this, but it works so good with these hoochies and trolling um, that it's kind of like, it's that's the lineup that I'm running. So what what is a hoochie? And I'm asking both of y'all, because when I think hoochie, I think of like lot lizards and like loose women. But like oh, yeah. y'all, y'all say hoochie all the time. Like what what is a hoochie rig? Like Here's a hoochie. It's like a squid. Okay. It's, just, it's a squid and we call what, them hoochies. What, what, why don't y'all just call them squid rigs? <laughs> so we just yeah. call them hoochies. That's all. <laughs> I, I think, I don't know if it's a West Coast thing. I, you know, on... If I was on the East Coast, and I would call it a skirt. Yeah, see, that makes sense to me as a skirt, but I don't know. Yeah, when, you're, I mean, when what, your dad what, calls it a hoochie, you call it a hoochie. Yeah, I guess yeah. so. What I mean, but uh, those, those like witch, uh, sea witches, aren't those what those are called for like deep sea stuff? Okay. Is, is there a lure that's called that you're saying? Or yeah. you're talking about ones that have big, big hoochies on them? I think they're big. I think it's just a big hoochie rig, dude. Yeah. Well, there's all sorts of stuff, you know, to shake at the fish down there. Um, hey, what part of the country are you from, Brian? I, I, I'm I know, like I know. 20 minutes from you. I, I know. I was talking to the other Brian. I was asking if he Oh, no. So I'm John. That was that was oh. because of the uh, our, oh. our Zooms were all messed up. Yeah. But I'm in oh, Texas. Oh, thank you. Thank you for telling me that. You're in Texas? Okay. Yeah. All right, John. Yeah, Zoom um, was all jacked up earlier. That's that's not on you, dude. <laughs> yeah, my bad. Um, you uh, what are you catching on those flies? If you don't mind me asking. Oh, dude, this is uh, this is gonna be a big. That's a pike. ripper. Yeah, it's Go gonna ahead. be a big. Yeah, it's gonna be a big pike or musky. I, I say pike. You know, like I err on the side of caution when I put like flash in flies. Because uh-huh. there is there is like an amount of flash that once you go over it, people like kind of scoff and they're like, "There's no way a muskie would eat that." I mean, but muskies eat like all kinds of stuff. But typically, the more flash you have in it, people say like that's more of like a pike fly or like a chain pickerel or a bass fly or something like that. But uh, this is going to be like a sixteen and a half inch muskie fly. Yeah, monster. Are you going to have a hook go back there? Or- yeah, so this is this is actually the back hook, and okay. then this hook will go up front here on doubled up forty pound wire. So I have eighty pounds of wire here with uh, some separation, I know. and then it'll be about. Well, you can't shit. You can't even see all that, but just all this plus this much hook. So it'd be about sixteen, sixteen and a half inches when it's all said and done. Yeah, man, it's a monster. I've never tiger or musky fished, um, and I'd like to do that. I'd like to knock that one off, catch one. I heard they're like the fish of a thousand casts, also. Yeah, ten thousand. Uh, ten thousand. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I've, I, you know, I, I don't know if John's been able to get out after musky. I have, and mm-hmm. you'll spend twelve to fourteen hours out there grinding on the river, and then all of a sudden, boom, you know. You, you've put yeah. out a lot of casts and then all of a sudden it's just there and it's on they're, they're cool fish um you know we have them uh you know around us here we have them up in uh like washington lake merwin and lake taps and all that kind of stuff that's like our closest musky fishing that we have um but you know to go after those are tigers uh but to go after the actual muscalunge you got to go to the midwest you know that's that's yeah. where it's at you know i mean i know there's east coast fisheries and and appalachian fisheries that have them too but uh, the, the most consistent you know canada and the northern midwest is like where it's at definitely got eaten are they good eats i i've never ate one i've we talked to a guy that we went out with i was with my friend in wisconsin who originally was from here in oregon he yeah. um he he asked the guy we went out with, are they good to eat? And he's like, I think they're okay, but we just don't eat them. You know, they, uh, they, they hold them they're, they're, to, to the people in the Midwest. They're, they're like a wild steelhead to us or, you know, yeah. something like that. You know, you're not, we, we, we have hatchery steelhead. We eat them. Yeah. They're great. But um, you know, they, they, they take a lot of care in the handling of the fish. I mean, most, most responsible anglers do, but they, they, they just won't eat 
that fish, they, it takes them a long time to get us, you know, up to that trophy size, like into the 46 to 50 inch range or, you know, 55 to 60 inch, you know, that's a big fish. Yeah. So, but well, I do know they, that pike is good. good. Releasing them. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Pike, pike is good. Yeah. Yeah. A lot okay. of people say that pike is good and people aren't as like upset about people eating pike. Yeah. Like the, uh, Eating muskies getting further and further away from, I think, people doing that. My thread just slipped. Um, there's a lot more conservation being brought up, like even like the DNR and stuff. Like you don't have to take the fish and um, they're, they're given records now. They're like certifying weights and stuff on the river in the net. You know, like they're literally sending out a biologist to certify the weight and measurements of fish for records now like you don't have to kill the fish anymore to get mm -hmm. the record which i think oh, that's that's yeah you eliminate the uh the need for the death uh yeah and people can still you know strive to catch a big one exactly cool. dude. yeah that's good yeah that's definitely the future and um you know there's just more lines in the water more boats but you know that's on like the peak season days it's always nice to get out there when you know everybody else isn't out <laughs> exactly yeah. dude yeah. well well and as you know our you know the the fisheries are changing a lot you know and and popular media is getting more people out you know people the pandemic got a lot of people out uh fishing and as you know fishing you know you started this company 20 years ago, you know, from what I could tell. So yeah. Um, the lure company started in, uh, 2000, like 19 or when I was oh, designing okay. that lure, but, um, I used, I went by King me fishing when I was guiding, uh, in Alaska and Oregon. So people might recognize that, you know? Okay. So, I, but you, I mean, you've been doing this all professionally for that time span. I mean, it's yeah, been... I got my captain's license when I was young and luckily I had sea time and I lived really an awesome existence in my twenties doing guiding. Um, and into my thirties, you know, I kind of like, it started to wear on me. I stopped like wanting to know the client's names and such, but I never lost, um, uh, my drive for the actual tug you know yeah so as you know that 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 pressure has increased and then it went through like a big decrease and now it's like really increased a lot like there was you can you can get a boat for a while because everybody was buying a boat because they were like well we don't know whenever we're going to go back to work so we might as well go out and fish so you couldn't yeah. even go down and get a boat. So you were lucky if you could even find a used boat for a reasonable price. And then you had, you know, this big influx and now, you know, people are going back to work. The recession, it's the economy's receding, but there's still quite a few people out there still hitting it pretty hard. But do you see it? Do you see that kind of waning off or do you see it just kind of changing hands? Do you see the guard changing hands here? Well, as far as new boats go, you know, I'm curious about that because I've seen a couple boat places because it affects prices and such. And I'm, I have a boat, so I, I always like to know the value of it. But, um, you know, people are still buying boats, even though loans are harder to get now. But I, the best thing as far as to tell would be to call down there and see, like, if, they're probably way down. I know that. But... Um, yeah, man, I'm looking forward to getting out there after Springer's here pretty soon. Yeah. So what what are you, what are you mostly in the targeting? What what fish are are like Chinook. your favorite? Chinook. <laughs> uh, I like. So, sorry, yeah, I just I, mean, I, I like how rapid that response was. Yeah. Like, <laughs> they, awesome. get, they, they get the biggest. You know, they they're the oiliest of all the salmon, um, and. I don't know, man. They're gorgeous. They tug harder. Yeah. You know, so I, I chase, I chase uh, Chinook um, for sure. I, but I, I love coho. Um, I love coho in the freezer. 
Mm -hmm. too. And and then you know, it's nice. It's coho can be fun and rapid and like exhilarating. Um, not only having one or two on at once or more, but um, as they get a little heavier around, uh, let's say the end of August, go. They're like four pounds in in uh, July, right? And then it seems like about a half a pound or a pound a week they gain. But oh, yeah, shit. no, I'm a Chinook. I'm a Chinook guy. You know, I'm always thinking. I used to think about, um, you know, I actually have a hook design that is illegal, so I I shouldn't even be talking about. It. Yeah, it's don't not talk legal. about it right now. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> we'll talk about it after we shut off the the, the podcast but um yeah <laughs> i i i, I kind of i can see where this one's going i i love fish and chinook that's that's the first salmon i caught was a spring chinook you know and mm. I, you you can't beat it because yeah they fight hard but man they are the best eating fish uh i mean hands down yeah. no, nothing beats a, a springer uh, it's just yeah, like yeah that's that's for sure you know? man I, I've said it once. I'll say it again, and I'll probably say it a million times in the future. Uh, I think you know if you had the list. I mean, out of out of your your fish that you enjoy eating, and you've caught halibut, and you've caught all these other fish. What are what what's like your top five you, you like to eat? Okay, okay. Wahoo is number one, and that was a pleasant surprise. Um, I like. I think Chinook um, would a belly or a collar piece would be my number two. Um, I halibut kind of grew on me. Like as, as soon as I learned everyone was like spending $20 a pound, I was just like, really? Um, but no, I love halibut and I like uh, the canary red rockfish. Oh yeah. You got and, a good selection. And, and for the, the fifth one, I'll tell you what I don't like is salmon shark. Really? It was gray and mushy. Okay. Yeah. You would and, think. And, they, and, and they're always bragging. They're like, we, we cut the skin off so you don't taste the pee. And you're like, oh, really? Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> I, I've heard I've heard shark can be very ammonia flavored. Yeah. Yeah. I tried that, it. I tried it. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's one thing. I've, I've never tried any shark ever. Um, I, I haven't even caught a shark, to be honest. And. I don't know if I'd have any desire to kill a shark to eat it anyways. I yeah. have eaten shark. Sorry. Yeah, what kind? Dude, I don't know. Like, um, so I was in the army and I was in Arizona at the time. I was at Fort Huachuca and we were grilling out. And uh, this dude's like, dude, I just bought shark from the commissary, which is like the Walmart on post. So I have no idea, but it was a very interesting flavor for sure. Yeah, they're an ancient fish, man, and they they urinate through their skin, but they're a vital part of the ocean, and you know, we all know that. Absolutely, mm. man. I so, guess I, as far as salmon sharks go, the uh, the females are in Alaska, and the on the male side they're in Russia, and that could be switched. Um, but then they join, of course, to to breed but there used to be a decent um salmon shark fishery going on up in alaska i don't know if, if i haven't seen that many pictures of them lately the last time i heard of a salmon shark was this last uh september we were out for non-select season and mm -hmm. uh uh out of yaquina and somebody got on the vhf and they're like yeah we got a shark in our gear which is like did that come in from the tuna grounds from the corners? And yeah. somebody said, Oh no, they're they're It's a salmon shark. They're, you know, 14 miles out. And I'm like, I, 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 to that point, I hadn't heard of a shark being that close in like 20 miles. Yeah. I've I'd heard about sharks. And then obviously when you get the tuna, the bluefin getting in the mix of those and you know, people are like, Oh, we got sharks in our gear. So they, you yeah. know, they, they haul out of there and they look for the next school of tuna. But um, you know, I, they're a fascinating shark that's for sure yeah cool looking they're, shark yeah they are their closest relative is the great white i'm it's kind of, they look like it too though you know but i guess the interesting part about that is that they can regulate their body temperature and hang out in alaska and russia it's probably the thing yeah that's, I guess, that's pretty, 
that's unique. I didn't even think about that. Yeah, and I guess that their main target fish is is pinks. Man, think if they release those in the uh, uh, Baltic Sea, because you know that the pink population in like uh, Sweden and Finland has uh, displaced the Atlantic salmon. No, so they, I did not know that. Yeah, so there was a big thing, uh, and because I nerd out on fish stuff and bi- like fish biology and all that. I, I had something, you know, how you have Google, it knows everything that you do all the time. It pops up recommended reading. And I read something, it was last year, about um, the displacement of the native Atlantic salmon to these pinks. And these pinks came in so thick. They were like talking runs of like almost a half million pinks up one river system. Like yeah. just insanity. Well, they should have almost predicted that it was going to happen because that's what pinks do. <laughs> Yeah, you know, they cloud a river with themselves. I, I used to hit them with my prop, you know, but <laughs> yeah, we did. <laughs> Dude, that's you know, insane. Uh, there's a couple, you know, real bad years where it's real thick and you're just cr- cruising down the river to go to your silver hole, you know, and you see a little blood behind you and a little bump. <laughs> oh, man, <laughs> I couldn't imagine that. Well, the, I know they get into the sound rivers uh, on uh, this year. The, the, there will be pinks running because it's an odd numbered year. So yeah. they get into the sound rivers just like rats, I guess. And I, from what I understand, you throw anything pink out there and they'll hit it. Yeah, they they're, you know, I don't know if it's like the universe balancing out, but, you know, they're the smallest, the least Actually, I would say that they they taste okay fresh, like a rainbow trout. But if they're in the river very long, they're, they're toast. But um, yeah, they they're the most they're the most kamikaze of all the salmon. Really uh, nibbling. Well, I mean, they bite. They they're so aggressive. You know, they're, they're even got, more aggressive than a chum. Well, the the thing is, I guess I also have to factor that when the pinks are in. I mean, I've had underwater cameras like just beneath my boat to see what was going by. And it's just like the never ending March of pinks wow. when they're in it's, it's you're like every now and then you'll see a coho and we're targeting coho. So of course our, our pink numbers, like we're just shaking them off, trying to shake them off. It was like shad fishing. <laughs> you, the pinks can be a blessing when there's no other fish to catch though. Yeah. Well, I, I've always wondered if they would they would ever reestablish this, you know, this far south into Oregon. I know that every once in a while you'll look at the Bonneville Dam count and you'll see a few pinks that went over the dam, which just kind of blows my mind because it's so far from salt. Right. Yeah. It. Uh, I swear, one time I was down a little east of Astoria and I saw a school of pinks, and what it looked like to me is the same thing I saw in Alaska, where they go up and almost like bite a thing of air. And then their tail would flicker and it looked like a pot of them. And then, you know, there's a lot of rivers between Astoria and, and Bonneville. So I had hopes. I was like, oh, there's some river getting some pinks. You know, that was like 10 years ago. Yeah. And it could be happening. Somebody, you know, some old lady could own some kind of property down like on the Klatskanai River or something like that, because that's where I could see them being, right? And yeah. she'd go out there. I don't know what all these fish are, but they're just running all over the place. And you go down there and there's like 20,000 pinks in a hole. And you're just like, oh, you know, like, oh, this is going to be a fun day. You know, <laughs> that's what we got to do with those big Chinook the terminal fisheries. Yes. People will be excited again. And, and not to mention healthy fish. The, a big fish is can, you know, it avoided a lot of things to get that size, you know. Yeah, for sure. It's, I hope that happens. Definitely. I, I think we're on the right track for sure. Um, and I know that, that this calls out to a lot of people with a lot of their uh, other fisheries throughout the United States. You know, I mean, what we're doing out here is we're really trying to pioneer, you know, fishery, um, you know, management and preservation. Uh, and, you know, this could apply for walleye. This could apply for white bass, striped bass, um, you know, you name it, this could apply for any of those types of fish that are migratory out of one body of water to the next into rivers, anything else, you know, great lakes, salmon and steelhead management, you know, this, this can all apply to that. And, you know, but in the West, we've just been, our rivers are so big, they're, they're massive. That's, that's the one thing 
when you talk to somebody from like the Great Lakes region or the East Coast, they when you say a river like the Clackamas or the Sandy or the Klaskenai or the the Calwitz or the Lewis, I mean, I could go through and name them. We don't consider those to be big rivers because we have the Columbia and the Willamette and, you know, you got Puget Sound and you have offshore. So they're, 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 you know, those rivers are small, but when people see these trib rivers, they're like, this is absolutely massive, like the Deschutes or something. It's just mm-hmm. such a huge river. It's intimidating for somebody that's used to, you know, fishing something the width of a ranch house versus something that can be, you know, an eighth of a mile wide in some stretches. I mean, as a trib river, that's a, that's a big difference. Yeah, we're lucky here. We we're are. lucky with the rivers around, you know. For sure. Different different genetics, different run times. Um, a lot of them are runnable with jet boats and and then of course drift boats. Yeah, us drift boat guys, you know, damn them, you know. <laughs> Going <laughs> scraping what rocks. Of, what kind of vessel do you have? I've got a 24 foot uh aluminum jet boat made by Motion Marine. Mm. And I kind of tricked it out. I blew the the Mercury Optimax. It like it was time, I guess. It blew. And I didn't want to put another loud one in, so I I got a racing jet ski a FZR 1.8 SVHO Yamaha racing jet ski 350 horsepower. And I I had three different people work on it, and the last guy really knocked it out of the park. And the boat runs good. It's got this pretty much same response as it had with the 200 Optimax at the jet. You know, I, I'm pretty sure that 350 is like, you know, I did get a new intercooler for it, but that's my boat. It's all open, and um, I'm actually working on a splash guard for it. What what is that? So it just it for, what for the yeah. prop launch or something or no? It, I have it drawn, but it it basically is two feet by seven feet, and it's in three quarters of an inch thick of hard rubber. Not hard rubber, but giveable rubber. And I'm attaching it to part of my bow. Motion Marine had a spray protector on their bow. It's aluminum thing that like a chine that goes down about four inches. And I'm going to put this rubber on that. And I believe it's going to knock down the spray. So like, you know, out here we give people rain gear on a sunny day because we'll be going across the bay or the river and that splash hits and it goes right back on you. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. It's, I don't know what my little book is. I'll show you guys a picture of it when it's done though. Yeah. I'll be interested to see. I've probably seen you out on the river plenty of times. Uh, we just didn't know who each other was. So, <laughs> yeah, I believe that. Yeah, we yeah. both went to schools in Portland. Yeah, um, Brian went to Franklin, and I went to Benson and Madison. So yeah. we got that connection for sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, we live close enough together, but there, there again, you know, um, you know, having having a jet like that uh and that large of a jet is definitely a huge advantage out west also and that's that's you know you have a columbia capable boat willamette capable you have offshore capable and then you have a trib river capable it's like the swiss army i know that i know that that's a great way to put a swiss army knife i just wanted to be able to go up a river and also out in the ocean um and you know i mean you could do that with an outboard and a pump but i just remember my dad like we we hit rocks on the the shoots when we you know we're young and the thing i like about jets is are you can just like you know you can go over a sandbar you go over a log you know you don't want to but you you can yeah it's definitely a safer than a prop boat and a lot of people are like how do you get a prop up through those rocks it's like that's not a prop that's a jet you know it's our rivers are rocky they get a lot of hazards they change all the time they're like ever morphing you know that's the whole thing like a gravel bar shifts 20 feet to the left and a major flood or you end up with multiple deadheads in a whirlpool or set you know they're always changing and so you know for me i drift boat so you know i'm not going super fast so even if i have a collision 
I can, you know, and I do everything I can to avoid that. But sometimes you just can't see, you know, you can't see what's underwater or glare or whatever. Uh, it, it just kind of bumps over. That's why you have yeah. a flat bottom vessel in, in those types of things. Same thing with a sled. It picks up and you're only going over, you know, a few inches of water when you're flying up the river. It makes a big difference. But for, for the types of lures that you're making and everything else, also a sled is very conducive to that type of fishing. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yes. Oh, and one other thing I wanted to say, considering we're talking about the rubber spray guard, um, I think it's something that people should consider doing. I did it to my aluminum boat. It's I put a bunch of those balls uh, that you basically see at Fred Meyer or Walmart, but they're 15 inch to 10 inch to six inch. Actually, no, I got them on uh, Amazon, but I, I took all the foam out of my floor, which was really wet, and I put these balls in that were half inflated and a little higher and now i've got a bunch of individually chambered air balls underneath my boat that will keep me from sinking um you know that that crash and that story with those two aluminum boats a couple years ago yeah it, it was good to see how fast those things sink and also very scary too nightmare stuff i you know i saw it and that just yeah, goes yeah. to prove you know i mean uh good seamanship skills and and uh paying attention to what you're doing out there that's that's huge and and that's a big dangerous river true yeah and a lot of um a lot of people are like you know they just caught two fish and they want to run back up and do it again and they've got all this adrenaline and endorphins and chemicals running through their head and it's what we all love to do but yeah i mean accidents do happen and that was too bad yeah so was it it avoidable or oh yeah it was an avoidable anything about that there was a chop and so the guy had his bow up kind of and you know he's probably like i actually i can't even i don't even want to say but it is on on you know there's a video of it somewhere okay and it's they go down quick yeah it just turns into a total combat fishery down there at the buoy 10 and uh you know it's just about bumper boats when the when the salmon start running it's such a constricted space but you know um oh so uh yeah, we're coming up on our hour here, Andrew, and uh, I just wanted to uh, make sure that we we kind of round out and cover the bases. We talked about the lures, we talked about fish conservation and running the rivers, and you know all this other stuff. But um, thank you. If people want to get some of your lures and and check out some of the lures and and their action and everything else, where can people go to find you? Furthernorthlures.com, and you know on the world wide web. Okay. Yeah. WW. Awesome. Please check me out. You know, I make bait wiggle. Um, I make uh, bait spin with these buoyant blades, the slide hole, slide plug. And I have a new lure coming out that makes herring and other bait fish swim dead fit dead bait fish and i i pretty much am making it from and for my key west type fishermen and um yeah it's a helmet and the fish swims and i'm hoping that it'll be coming out soon well dude um i do want to thank you for coming on but i'd like to ask a few more questions if you don't mind about your bait so what was um so the plug the like the half plug that that's the twerk right yeah yeah so what was the idea behind that you just wanted to add some buoyancy or kind of i want what, what's the idea when we when people are fishing with salmon eggs in the situation like we you know back trolling they're pretty much stationary unless you're um, jigging them we call back bouncing but it's jigging you know essentially and i wanted i believed that i could make bait wiggle and this happened to be the way that i stumbled upon doing it you know i tried like four or five different ways beforehand um 
so and like i said this uh this the torque now has a fast water option at the topper hole but i i don't think i totally answered your, your question there then i might no, have. That, that's that's okay so what what was the you wanted to make the bait move when you say bait you mean like um you were talking about eggs and then you said a shrimp Same so there. is it just like any shrimp. bait that you would normally um well, that you guys would use for like salmon and steelhead and stuff over there, right? Yeah, you know, we we use prawns sometimes, and you know, they do have like a different nose, and but it it worked for those. And I I really wanted and want. I didn't do enough as a travel salesman to get it all over, but I'd like to see how we do like a clear one down in Florida, moving a shrimp or something, but. Yeah, I basically wanted to give bait action, at the action of a plug, you know. Uh, I mean, it makes sense to me, dude. <laughs> yeah, it does. It does. Yeah. And someone had to do it. Yeah, and I think I think like like the twerk, the twerk is just so universal. It, you know, it could be anchor fished, it could be trolled, it can be back trolled. Um, you know, it, it's put a hoochie just... behind it with a little bit of a hunk of herring. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's offshore in river. It, it, you know, I could even see a smaller variant of it being used for kokanee. Um, oh, or, yeah. or, no, I've, or uh, I've rainbows or I've got kokanee guides that, uh, yeah, there's a guy down in California. He, he sent a little video of it and he's like telling me how many he caught. Um, and when that happened, I just had a fire last year and I, like all my production went down and I didn't talk about it at all really except to my friends but um yeah no I'm uh I've got the small all this stuff goes all the way down to like you know wow I can I can make them smaller too but I've got seven sizes smallest sizes as a good steelhead slash kokanee size for all the lures man I I, sevens I gotta check them out for sure <laughs> Yeah, I'll I'll send you guys a care package. I'd love to. I should have already done it. Oh, no, you uh, don't have to, dude. Yeah, but still, well, you know, we'll definitely uh, we definitely got to try. It. I appreciate your guys' time here, and uh, no, I'll definitely send you guys some lures, and I'll get your addresses like via email. Uh, well, I, I'll definitely appreciate it. I know John will too, and you know, it's just. So cool because uh, it's it's U.S. made. It's a, a solid lure. It has multiple functions and purposes. Here, you know, I I think we we tend to focus on all the salmon and steelhead stuff, which is all we've been salmon steelhead salmon, you know. But I can see yeah. so many other uses for these lures, uh, you know, uh, across the country too. You know, from walleye, you know, like we talk about bottom walkers and bow tie blades for walleye. I can see, I can see uh, uh, your lures being very effective for those fish, you know, under the right trolling circumstances, especially yeah. if they're working for kokanee. But yeah, kokanee trout. Eric, Eric Swanson caught a couple uh, um, walleye with the twerk in the in the sound, or not in the sound, but in the channel. In the channel, really. I, yeah. I would love to get some walleye in the channel. I've only got one out of the Willamette, so. <laughs> Yeah, I haven't actually done any walleye fishing, and I keep telling myself I'm going to go with the walleye guy, <laughs> which is kind of a dick thing to do. But um, no, nah, it's not that dick. You just <laughs> don't want to be in their fishing zone, you know. Right, right. Back when they're working. Yeah. Wait till they're off but, work and then go play cleanup. Yeah. But um, yeah, you know, so. People can check you out on your website at furthernorthlures.com. Yeah, and honestly, the, all the evidence is on Instagram and Facebook, like the Further North Lures Instagram slash Further North Lures on Facebook. You know, there's probably half the fish that I've been on the boat with make it on there. and But it just shows you that they, they are working and they're hanging with other lures, sometimes excelling even more often. Um, but... Yeah, no, I think it's it's a good space that I'm in, and I'm I'm having a good time. 
definitely i would i would love to get out on the river with you andrew and and have you give a master class lesson and how to rig and fish the lures and the different types of things but i mean you you have so much great information on your website it, it really does have a lot of good stuff and i think i think that a lot of people uh, especially the conventional folks out there that are trolling for uh salmon and steelhead or trolling for walleye or uh you know back bouncing baits or you know in, in any capacity these types of lures and and what you're innovating there that's going to make a uh, that's uh it's pretty cool stuff i i'm definitely excited to try it thank you i really appreciate being on here guys i got can i do one more thing real quick yeah sure. okay so i also have a an invention and a uh called the eating spoon i'm just showing you guys this is not a fishing lure it's meant for uh ramen um so <laughs> i invented the fishing lures oh yeah check it out i you didn't get to see it there we go oh that's it, sick. it's sco it scoops up the noodles so you get broth and noodles so it's, you're um, the eating spoon guy that likes all of our story okay hey man. yeah i'm a founding met i'm like one of the first guys so i i had to keep it with, real with the eating spoon <laughs> I was like, who is this? I was like, the eating yeah, spoon. Yeah. Oh, okay. Now the whole yeah. picture comes together. I'm like, what is a ramen spoon company like about fishing? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, the guy behind it is a fishing fanatic or, a, you know, I, I think about it a lot. Yeah. I'm, I, and I hope to get out and um, catch some steelhead this winter too. So we'll see what happens. It has been a grinder. <laughs> yeah it's been I, a grinder yeah i mean steelhead don't really coincide until march well we'll just say yeah that's that that sounds uh <laughs> i think i think sturgeon's gonna be on the play game here for a few so uh yeah. it, it, it's been a couple long sundays of going down to the coast and rowing and uh rowing back up runs and redrifting and everything else. So it's been just a little bit tricky, but March for sure. March is definitely a happy time. Hey, thanks a lot, Brian. I, I hope to get on the water with you. Definitely. So Andrew, thanks again for coming on. Really appreciate it. Everybody go check out Andrew's stuff. Uh, go over to furthernorthlures.com or go uh, check him out on Instagram and Facebook. All of his information will be in the show notes. You can also check out the eating spoon as well. Uh, if you have any questions about how to get in contact with Andrew, you can always reach out to us as well. Uh, we can get you lined up. Uh, and if you want to get in touch with us, if you want to talk to John, you can find him on Morris Flyco. If you want to talk to me, you, of course you hit us up on working class fishing podcast, or you can go over to my personal page, which is PNW uh, vintage fishing. And if you want to check out all of our other stuff, we do have the YouTube channel. If you're watching this on YouTube, you found us. Uh, but if you're listening and you want to see what we got going on YouTube, just look us up at Working Class Fishing Podcast. And John, you want to roll those sponsors one more time? Absolutely. Andrew, once again, thanks for coming on, dude. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks. And thanks. Everybody, thanks, for, uh, thanks for checking us out, as always, and listening this far in the episode. Uh, thank you to all of our sponsors. and. Uh, our sponsors are Anadromous Fly Company, 317 Flies, uh, Mr. Shear Cure, Naughty Tackle, um, Lid Rig, and Angry Rooster. Angry Rooster and CD Fishing USA. I used to have all these written down, but I don't. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll always come in for the assist anyway. So, but, anyways, folks. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, make sure to leave us five stars uh, or a review and rating on Apple Podcast or over on Spotify, whatever listening platform you're listening to us on. Make sure to hit that thumbs up if you're on YouTube. So until next time, thank you so much, everybody, for listening. I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you guys a lot. I really appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, dude.